All right, I think we're ready to get going. So, hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, welcome to the fifth installment of the National Environmental Education Week's Greening STEM webinar series for the 2013-2014 school year. And with EU Week coming up next week, we're really excited to have such a great topic for you tonight. My name is Jeff Chandler, and in this webinar, we'll be looking at some of the big picture issues that environmental engineers are working to solve today. These grand challenges for engineering, as identified by the National Academy of Engineering, include many of the most important environmental concerns for the 21st century. From the way we use what the world has to offer to the way we explore its many remaining mysteries, engineering is the guiding light, ladder, and tool in a very literal sense that allows us to meet these grand challenges. We have two great presenters tonight who will provide a deeper understanding of what the grand challenges are and why they are important and how we can incorporate these focuses into an educational curriculum. Just a few quick notes on the way the webinar works before we get into it. Everyone's microphone has been muted to make sure we can hear the presenters clearly. Of course, we still want this to be an interactive webinar and welcome all feedback and questions. We just ask that you contribute through the chat feature on the right. Uh, we also noticed that some people may have a video screen in the upper right. You can click the bar right below it to minimize that. To make a comment or ask a question, simply type into the text box and click send. Notice that the comment or question can either go to everyone or you can select a specific recipient. If you're having technical difficulties, please address your concerns to my colleague listed in the participant list as Neef David, and we will try to help you out. We ask that you address all questions intended for our presenters to Neef host instead of the specific presenter or the group. And this will make it easier for me to collect the questions so that our presenters can respond to them later in the Q&A segments of the webinar. We will have time to answer these questions at the end of each segment, but you should feel free to enter questions into the chat box as they come to mind throughout the presentation. You can adjust the size of the slides you are viewing using the zoom percentage option in the bottom left of the screen. A recording of this webinar, the slides used, and a list of links and resources described will be available on our website tomorrow. Before I introduce our presenters for tonight, I want to give you a brief introduction to National Environmental Education Week, or EE Week. EE Week 2014's theme is Engineering a Sustainable World, and it is being sponsored by Samsung. The official EE Week will take place next week, April 13th to 19th, but EE Week events will be occurring throughout the month in celebration of environmental learning. This year's focus on engineering is a continuation of our multi-year focus on greening STEM. Each year, we focus in on one of the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, and look at how developments and teaching practices in that field are being used to enhance environmental education. Now that we are only a few days away from EE Week, we would love to get the word out to as many people as possible. We've put together a page of promotional tools that you can use to share EE Week with your school or community. Items available include a flyer, web badge, newsletter posts, suggested social media posts, and more. So please feel free to visit our website and use any of those to get the word out. Here's a list of those resources offered and the website where you'll be able to find those. I'm now going to quickly introduce our presenters for tonight. Randy Atkins is the Director of Communications and Media Relations for the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, where he assists journalists with coverage of stories about engineers and engineering. He led a high-profile effort to identify the 21st century's grand challenges for engineering, which is having wide-ranging impacts, especially in education. Randy reports weekly engineering innovation radio broadcasts and has been involved in just about every other form of science communication. Robert Matheson is in his 38th year as a researcher, science educator, principal, and founding board member of the three schools of choice. He is currently the principal of the Wake North Carolina State University STEM Early College High School which is in its third year of operation. The school currently has 164 students in grades 9 to 11 and will, be, and will add two more cohorts of ninth graders this year and next. The school is located on the Centennial Campus of North Carolina State University. So at this point, I'm excited to hand the presentation over to Randy Atkins so that he can explain a little bit more about what the grand challenges for engineering are and begin tonight's discussion on the importance of their inclusion in environmental engineering education. So, Randy, if you give me a second, I will unmute you and give you control and then let you take it from here. So, all right. Thank you, you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. 
and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you tonight. Um, I thought I'd first start out by letting everyone know, uh, in case they don't, what the National Academy of Engineering is. Uh, so we're part of the National Academies in, here in Washington, D.C., which also include the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Research Council. We were created uh, actually way back at the time during uh, Lincoln's time. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences was created to advise the government on issues involving science and technology, and that's what we still do today. Um, each of the uh, honorific organizations, the Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, also elect members. Um, uh, you can't just join, you become elected for accomplishments, and we bring people together to uh, answer uh, difficult questions and to um, enhance the profession. We have you know, interests in areas of um, a, a more diverse workforce, better engineering education, and those sorts of things. So. Um, we do a lot of studies, this, uh, and we had done one at the turn of the century um, that, that you see uh, this coffee table book about. It looked at the great achievements of engineering of the 20th century. And um, this was uh, developed by uh, a group of experts, just like the report I'm about to tell you about, but also involved input from engineering societies and others. Um, and it looked again. It looked at it picked out the 20 great achievements of the 20th century. And if you just look at the list, and I, I don't have the list in front of me here, but I'll tell you a few of them. They include electrification, the automobile, the airplane, radio and television, computers, the internet, um, nuclear technology, spacecraft, highway system. You know, the world is completely different today than it was just 100 years ago. And there's no reason to believe that that uh, advance in technological pro uh, progress won't continue. Um, so at the beginning of this century, we decided to look in the opposite direction and say, what are the grand challenges for engineering in the next century? Now, it's important to note that we weren't trying to predict the future because predictions always fail, but rather to identify the game changers, identify those things that if we were successful could actually change the way we live in the next century. So what we did is we uh, gathered a committee of some of this generation's leading technological thinkers and doers. Maybe you'll recognize some of the faces on this slide, but it was chaired by former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. It included people like Nobel laureate Mario Molina, Google co-founder Larry Page, uh, Craig Venter, the genome pioneer who uh, raced the government and beat them in the in the in the genome um, uh, to, to to map the human genome, and created uh, included Bernadine Healy who led the Red Cross and the National Institutes of Health, Dean Kamen, uh, Jane Lubchenco who just recently was the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, those sorts of people. It's an international and and fairly diverse committee, um, and they uh, also took in input from around the world. We had input from not only um, engineer, other engineering societies and other engineers, we had input from 40 different countries around the world. And um, they were, that was all taken very seriously. The committee ultimately uh, came up with 14 grand challenges for engineering in the next century. Now, it, 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 the committee admitted that this is not a comprehensive list. There are certainly other challenges out there, but this was an, an example list. And, it was, and as I said a, a moment ago, if any of these challenges were to be solved, they'd be game changing. They changed the way we live. Um, also, with it, there are fairly broad challenges. You'll notice. So, within each of them, um, there are many, many other challenges. Um, the challenges were. Uh, separated by the committee into four themes. Generally speaking, those are sustainability, which is what we're going to probably talk about the most today, um, security, health, and simply joy of living, because all challenges aren't problems. Um, some of the things that, some things that engineers will come up with in the next century, we don't even know we need today. Um, and so we thought it was important, uh, very important to have that last category, you know, um, challenges that just enhance the way we live. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through every one of these challenges in detail, obviously, tonight, but you can find out more about them at this website, www.engineeringchallenges.org. 
Um, it's a it's a easy to read uh, website. Um, our report, though it was thoroughly reviewed, like all Academy reports, so we in fact probably the most reviewed report in the history of the Academies. I think we had 50 some reviewers, and, and uh, yeah, very thoroughly uh, researched. It's 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 actually a very easy to read and small report. It's not technical in any way, and it was done uh, that way on purpose because the report was from the very beginning, and the reason I led the project as the communications person at the Academy to engage the public in a discussion about um, what engineering can do for us uh, and to help young people understand who engineers are and what they do. Uh, the project inspired a series of summits across the country at universities, um, the first of which was held at uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I, um, at the time the summit was held, um, the, the fir this first summit was held, there was actually a snowstorm, and um, but nevertheless, it was an overflow crowd at, at the summit. And Business Week uh, wrote an article about the summit in, in which they, uh, the subtitle was, I, I always remember this because I think it fits perfectly, students may resist geek studies, but they'll flock in for the opportunity to change the world. And so I think that's the power of these grand challenges. They show... Uh, people, uh, how they can, how young people, how they can go out and make a difference, and how they can quite literally change the world. They show engineering is not a dry subject that involves, um, you know, tons of math and this and that, but it tells you why you need to understand that math and what you can do with it. It allows teachers in classrooms, math classes rooms, for example, when students raise their hand and say, yeah, but when am I ever going to need to learn that? Uh, it allows them to say, well, Look at, these, look at this grand challenge. If you want to be a part of solving this, you might need to know the basics. And so it gives teachers a powerful tool. Um, so that's an important thing to talk about um, in education. Uh, so it's not just in this country that we're interested. These aren't just, uh, it's important to note that um, these aren't just challenges for this country, for the U.S. They were, from the very beginning, meant to be global challenges. And so we've been expanding our reach. And just last year, we held a summit in London um, a Global Grand Challenges Summit in London, and I, I pull up a slide, uh, this slide in particular, to show you that we're even attracting celebrities to these summits now. That's Will I Am, the, f the former uh, lead uh, singer for the Black Eyed Peas, and uh, he, he came to speak at our summit. Uh, he was on the same panel as our next speaker, by the way. Um, but uh, so you know, we had uh, we, we're. The challenges are, 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 are uh, going global, but they're inspiring all sorts of things. The White House uh, ha has recently created their own Grand Challenges initiative, and they, were, they have admitted they've been inspired by this program. There have been poster contests. There have been video contests. The last USA Science and Engineering Festival was themed on the Grand Challenges. We just did a competition with Disney and Marvel that tied themes of the Grand Challenges for Engineering to the movie Iron Man 3. Major corporations are using them as their guiding framework. There are sections in textbooks and courses in schools throughout not just this country but in the world. The Egyptian government is interested in incorporating them into their high schools. And um, now um, Rob Matheson, who will talk next, is the principal of the high school you see pictured here. There, I'll let Rob talk about the school in detail, but... Uh, Basically, they're incorporating the grand challenges into their entire curriculum, and it's a powerful concept because it gets rid of the stovepipes in classes. Now you can relate history to your science class, and um, uh, and your math class can be related to your music class, and uh, so it gets rid of the stovepipes of subjects. It provides inspiration and motivation. Um, it it makes uh, learning relevant, and. Uh, and what we found is that it's attracting um, underrepresented groups because um, we find that uh, women and underrepresented groups tend to not go into engineering because they don't see it as for them. They see it as um, geeky. Um, but if you present it in a way that um, allows them to see how it can help people, we find it to be um, much more appealing. So, um, again, um, there were 14 challenges, and I'm not going to have time to go through them all here. Um, but and, and, again, I encourage you to go to that website. And we also have booklets available for, for schools. But I'm going to touch on a few because um, we are dealing with the – I'm going to touch on the, the few that deal with environmental issues here very quickly, just to give you a sampling of them. Um, this one um, – is, is to make, make solar energy economical. Um, one te this technology is, 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 um, 
is, is one that the committee thought would be particularly effective um, for producing ec electricity, solar energy. A significant advances in solar technology are needed, though, for large-scale solar arrays to be cost-competitive with carbon-based sources for pro providing power for the electric grid. And achieving these advances are really hard engineering challenges that include things like a doubling or tripling of efficiency and electrical conversion of solar arrays from the present levels that are about 10 to 20 percent. There are going to be some nanotechnology applications that could help here, for example. We're going to need a two-fold improvement in the cost of fabrication of solar arrays by creating new, new materials. And, the and we're going to need development of new ways to store large amounts of electricity, perhaps by using fuel cells. So those are some of the challenges within this particular challenge. In addition to using energy from the sun to produce electricity, we could try to engineer the sun's energy source, which is fusion, here on Earth. If successful, it can be harnessed for virtually limitless clean energy. Two large-scale fusion projects are already underway, the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. They recently had success releasing a small amount of energy by fusing hydrogen atoms into helium using lasers. And then there's the so-called ITER, spelled I-T-E-R, project in southern France. That's an international effort that uses magnetic fields to push hydrogen atoms together. And it's hoped that fusion can be demonstrated there in about five years or so. But still, making such, energy, such an energy source practical is going to require huge technological breakthroughs. Another of our challenges is to develop carbon sequestration methods, because practical ways of providing such alternative energy sources as fusion and solar will continue to be a challenge for some time. Society will continue to use fossil fuels and deal with their environmental impacts. The threat of global warming makes the capture of carbon dioxide emissions, therefore, an urgent priority. So this challenge is the ability to develop uh, these methods on math massive scales, securing carbon dioxide away in places like the deep ocean where it won't get back into the atmosphere. This next challenge is a little discussed environmental challenge to manage the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is the most common element in the atmosphere. The cycle by which it's taken up by plants and into the food chain and back into the atmosphere has been drastically altered by industrial processes and fertilizers used for agriculture. The results include smog, acid rain, polluted water, and greenhouse gases. So engineering breakthroughs must be found to rebalance this system in a very hungry world. A challenge that uh, may seem odd because, uh, again, I didn't show you the list, but it was actually in the great achievements, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, ubiquitous supply of clean water is, is, is again, uh, in our grand challenges. Um, while it's taken for granted in most parts of the U.S., it's still an urgent problem in many areas of the world, and innovative new technologies are going to be needed both for personal and large-scale water needs in order to pr prevent disease and to have a more secure world. So that's why it's still a grand challenge. This one you might not uh, immediately understand why I put into the environmental area, but finding ways to Enhance virtual reality is another priority. Fooling our brains into thinking we're in certain environments has applications ranging from military exercises to medical training to long-distance meetings that provide face-to-face -face interaction without travel. But also, think about a smaller carbon footprint without all of that travel. Uh, the quest to restore and improve urban infrastructure is a challenge that looks towards civil engineering projects from innovative transportation solutions to new architectural styles, but also green technologies are going to be very important in improving our infrastructures. And finally, uh, there's an important challenge to engineer the tools of scientific discovery that will lead the way to advances in areas like all of those that I just mentioned. The engineer's role in this has largely been overlooked, especially in popular culture, but they're critical to the discovery of science. One thing I'd quickly like to mention, because it's of interest to, uh, it ought to be of interest not just to universities, but to K-12 through uh, schools who are interested in uh, advancing their students to universities, they should know about the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. This is a program that's now active in about uh, 18 colleges and universities across the country and is taking root in about uh, dozens more, maybe 40 or so more. 
and we're in a, and the White House has just challenged us to uh, um, ramp up that initiative and get at least 50 schools involved uh, in, in this program uh, and said it would be worthy of a White House event if we did. And the reason is that this program is a, a program that takes college students and it trains them to be the renaissance engineers of the future that go out and solve the grand challenges of engineering. It's, as shown in this slide, has five components, a research experience component, an interdisciplinary curriculum called Engineering Plus, because engineering students, uh, it must be realized engineers, while they'll, they'll be critical to solving the grand challenges for engineering, they won't be able to do it alone. It's going to require many disciplines, and engineers need to learn how to interact with people in ethics and law and politics and all sorts of other dis disciplines. So we find that to be a very important element. And there's an entrepreneurial element. Um, uh, uh, we want students to th dream up new ideas and innovations and market them. Uh, there's a global dimension because, again, these aren't just U.S. issues. And there's a service learning component. So students need to go out in their community and, and do projects that, that help in their communities. Um, the, the, the program um, has uh, students uh, out doing lots of fascinating things, developing devices that use solar energy to purify drinking water in Africa, reverse engineering the brain to find cures for Parkinson's disease, developing fuel production techniques that can be adapted in developing countries, building and sustaining infrastructure like bridges in Nicaragua. So the students get to do some uh, really uh, amazing and fascinating things. Um, uh, again, this is my, this is the uh, slide with my uh, name and contact information on it. I would be happy to answer any questions in, in here in this forum, but feel free to use that email to contact me um, uh, out, outside of this as well. Um, be, we, we, what we're really trying to do with this Grand Challenges project is, is, is to start a movement. And I have put this slide on. It's because dreams need doing. We, we, need, we have important problems that need to be solved. We need to educate and excite the young people of this generation to go out and take them on. We think the Grand Challenges for Engineering help, as I mentioned, engage and inspire students, and particularly underrepresented groups. What's fascinating is that Grand Challenge Scholars Program that I just told you about is more than 50% women. And if you know anything about engineering curricula in colleges, that's unheard of. This, uh, this project tells students what an engineer is. It sort of changes the stereotype of an engineer. It shows, en it shows students that engineering is a creative endeavor, um, and that's critically important. Uh, we need creative people to go out and solve some of the biggest problems of our time. Uh, it encourages collaboration and critical thinking. And um, we find the students that are in these programs are uh, geared up and excited about it. And I think that uh, Rob Matheson is going to tell you uh, more about that now. So I'm going to pass the torch. Uh, I'll pass it to our host, and we'll proceed right, from there. Great. Thanks, Randy. We're going to take a couple seconds for questions, because we've had a few come in. And please feel free to enter in any questions you have for Randy into the chat box on the right. If you can't see that chat box, uh, it may be minimized. Um, but definitely send your questions in to me, and then I will voice them to our presenter so that hopefully we can get some of your questions answered. Um, so to start things off, we had a question come in from Terry, who asks, are there elementary schools that have embraced the Grand Challenges theme? So it definitely seems like these themes are uh, well applied at the high school level with getting ready for college careers or mentorship programs. Um, and just the level of understanding, but can you think, is there a way that these themes could be introduced at an elementary level? I think the answer is certainly yes. I, although, and and I have uh, been, in, uh, I've had elementary school teachers contact me about this. Although I have to admit that I don't know of a school that has really um, taken them on. Yeah, I think there are examples of schools that have used them a little bit in their teaching but not in the way that, for example, you're about to hear about it at Rob Matheson's school. I don't think that it's, it's happened yet. Uh, that said, um, I'm doing a lot of other things outside the classroom to sort of engage that age group. In fact, I just had a discussion with a company where we're talking about creating children's stories, including storybooks and um, webisodes even, uh, and um, uh, online learning tools where we're geared toward um, uh, uh, elementary school students. And so we are are uh, certainly going to actively approach it from that angle, and um, I, again, I am open to working with any elementary schools that might be interested in, in helping in any way that I can, because I think that um, uh, most of the challenges certainly um, are appropriate for elementary schools. Great. 
Uh, we had another question from M. Davies who asks, can we find a list of participating universities on the website? Yes, you can. Uh, the website for the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, uh, uh, I'm, if I, I, I don't think I'm going to get it wrong. I think it's simply www.grandchallengescholars.org. Um, but if I misremembered that, simply go, you know, Google Grand Challenge Scholars Program, and you'll see the website. They have their own website, and, um, and on that website is a list of schools, yes. Uh, we had a question come in from Carol earlier on about uh, the resources that are available for K-12 educators. And so you mentioned the Grand Challenges Scholars Program um, and now this engineeringchallenges.org. Uh, are there any other resources that you would recommend for educators uh, thinking about introducing the Grand Challenges into their own classes? Yeah, currently the, the engineeringchallenges.org is, is our main portal. As I just mentioned, uh, we are uh, um, uh, working on developing uh, elementary school material that, w uh, if you go to that site, you'll see there's a little button for kids, but it doesn't really, it's not, it's not developed at all yet. But we hope to develop that in the future and create resources um, for students in, in elementary grades. Um, although, uh, it's certainly I'll have to admit that the, it's sort of uh, the, the educational outreach with the Grand Challenges is most advanced in the upper uh, upper ages um, and less so as currently as uh, as you go down in age. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we got a question. I wonder, just thinking about all of these challenges, and uh, certainly some you know, seem if we could harness that power of the lithium battery, you know, having it supply for, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, it's 15 years. That's you know, amazing, or unlimited, you said, at one point. Um, are there some of these challenges that you think are you know, the most uh, attainable at this moment? Is there one that seems the closest at hand, given the current knowledge and technology? Um, well, I guess there well, probably isn't really an end goal of some sort, but of making large advancements in one of these soon? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. Uh, I think a breakthrough could happen in any one of these at any time. Solar energy, um, you know, could be on the cusp. Most people think fusion is probably the furthest one away. One thing I should note is that the the uh, White House uh, launched an initiative based upon one of these grand challenges to reverse engineer the brain called the Brain Initiative that's take, that, that um, I think uh, they decided was, um, you know, most compelling because it would capture the imagination, although I don't know if it's the closest to being... Uh, realized. Um, I'm just looking, you know, through our list. Um, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, I, I don't know the, the answer to that question. We'll see. Um, but I think that w one of the beauties of of this list of grand challenges is, as I said early on, they're very broad, and within each of these challenges are many other challenges. So a student that has any, almost any interest, can can say, you know, I want to pursue this particular grand challenge. I want to be a part of this grand challenge. I think that the, the, what their their interests can fit anywhere within these challenges. That's, that's inspiring. I think, yeah, there is a lot of room for uh, students who are interested to get involved and make a difference. Well, thank yes. you, Randy. And at this point, I think we'll uh, move on and take, uh, turn the presentation over to Robert so that we can hear a little bit more about Wake North Carolina State University Early College High School's attention to the grand challenges. So. Uh, thank you again, Randy. And Robert, I'm going to unmute you and give you control of the presentation here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay, okay good to go. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be with everybody tonight. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to give you a perspective from uh, a former science educator, uh, researcher, uh, current principal, on how the Grand Challenges is such a wonderful viewpoint in terms of secondary education, and, and we'll talk about the, the makeup of the school. We're grade 9 through 13, so we're an early college, a five-year program. Um, but it is, it is just amazing to watch the students engage in a thematic approach through the Grand Challenges for Engineering in, in a purposeful way that cuts across not only the disciplines of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, but we also, here at the STEM Early College, we, we embrace this notion of how important the humanities are to 
solving these problems. And, and when you hear me talk tonight and, and see the information on the slides, I think you're going to go back to Randy's presentation and say, oh, I heard Randy say that and Randy said that. So um, we really are making good strides uh, in our third year of, of bringing this style of teaching, uh, project-based learning, meaningful use of technology, integrated curriculum, uh, whole child development, um, it, it is making a big, big difference. So it's, it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I want to start by just listing the grand challenges. And <clears throat> I was an assistant principal for instruction in Wake County Schools uh, back uh, from 2004 to 2010. And when we, they were first talking about the creation of the school, they were focusing strictly on engineering. And <clears throat> it just never gained enough traction. But when this notion of the grand challenges came along in terms of a focus, I remember having an aha moment hearing about the school because I said as a former science teacher, this, this is it. Because if you think about the four basic scientific disciplines of life, earth, chemical, and physical, each of these challenges is going to meet one of those scientific criteria, and then, then you build upon that. And that, that, in essence, is how we take a grand challenge and align it with, with a grade level. Um, just want to draw your attention to, um, because we are uh, doing this program in honor of National Environmental Education Week, <clears throat> but if you look at these 14 grand challenges, over half of them have a very, very strong environmental component. So for all of you environmental science teachers out there, um, the grand challenges absolutely would be something that uh, you could do in a, a broad-based thematic approach. This next slide is, is really interesting to me because if you think, if you go back to your old psychology 200 days and when you learned about Maslow's hierarchy, um, you always start in terms of taking care of oneself, your physiological needs, and then you move to making your world safe, and then this idea of belongingness, don't know if that's really a word, but it is now, and esteem, and then self-actualization. Well, if you look at the grand challenges, they are very much aligned. So it's almost like the National Academy of Engineering was thinking about the Earth in terms of these grand challenges that are before us. In order for this planet to sustain, we first need to take care of the sustainability issues. And so if you think back to that first slide, you know, things like making solar energy economical, uh, providing access to clean water, and, and that kind of thing. So this is just a, a very interesting little twist in terms of, um, you know, how the grand challenges, you can think about uh, Mother Earth. I think it's important, or I told Randy and Jeff that um, I don't want to bore you with this kind of detail, and, and in general there's a lot of information on these slides. A big part of my job tonight is to present this information and for you to have a takeaway, because a lot of you are probably thinking about, well, how can we use the grand challenges in the school or school system that I'm at? Um, but I think it's important to go back and think, because really we're a combination of two concepts. We're a STEM school, but we're also an early college. And the first early college in North Carolina opened in, in 2005. Um, I think the, the first early colleges in the country go back to 2003. And it really came as a result of uh, an economic development uh, venture by the state of North Carolina. North Carolina very interested in changing their economic engine from tobacco, furniture, um, you know, some of the foundations that have carried this state for uh, decades, uh, times are changing. And so where are the jobs now? Well, the jobs are in the STEM-related jobs. You've all heard uh, comments about for every one, uh, one person uh, there's four STEM jobs for every one person who is qualified, and it's, and it's the reverse for the non-STEM jobs. You've got four people looking for a non-STEM job. So North Carolina was really interested in an innovative school that would support economic and workforce development. And so they created this jobs commission, joining our businesses and schools commission. And they were wrestling with this theme for the school. And uh, Dr. Louis Martin Vega is the dean of the um, School of Engineering at NC State and, and one of the leaders uh, in the development of the uh, grand challenges. And if the idea is to let's go after the skills and the knowledge, uh, work experiences, career exploration um, for 21st century jobs, how can we do that? How, how can we engage students to promote a STEM education or in particular engineering education? Um, well, 
one way to do that is to go back to what Randy said. Kids nowadays are very interested in solving problems. They want to make a difference in this world. And so the grand challenges allow you to do that because they are the challenges that um, our kids in school today and their kids and their grandkids, um, it's going to take that number of generations to solve some of these things. So um, the state of North Carolina became convinced that, hey, this, this National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges is a great hook uh, and especially for underserved, underrepresented kids, and, and we can try to tap into that population of kids that typically would say, this is not for me. Um, and so in 2010, it was proposed that, that the school uh, be created as a pilot, and then we opened in August 2011 with 55 ninth grade kids. I want to talk a little bit about uh, differentiating between underserved and underrepresented because they're, they're really two different things here. Uh, and this slide was put together by our dean of students. Um, underserved students are those who do, don't maximize their potential in a traditional comprehensive school. So this could be kids at the upper end of the spectrum um, who just don't develop those 21st century soft skills. They're, they're not good collaborators. They don't work well in groups. Um, they've got the academic horsepower, but they're, they're just not maximizing their potential like we would like for them in terms of preparing them uh, to go into engineering at NC State. Um, underrepresented would be just as it sounds. So women in engineering is a classic exa example. So not represented in the STEM disciplines by gender ethnicity. Um, first time college going, you've heard that uh, discussed. <clears throat> what we do every year, and this past year, we had 240 applications for 50 slots at the school. Half of the students that are, are uh, admitted to the school are first time college going kids. And what we're finding is that these kids, uh, not only can they do the work, but they're enjoying the work. Uh, and then the last piece in terms of target is that you really want kids who can accept the challenges of an accelerated school uh, leading towards a college education. Uh, a little bit about recruitment practices. I'm not going to go all the way uh, through this, but um, it, at the bottom here in bold and in, in the larger font, you can see the current demographics of the school. So we are not a prep school for science and math. We're a very much what I call a plain Jane school. So I would like to see um, our male-female ratio uh, get to that 50-50. Uh, so we're working slowly to get that. But we've got a, we have over 60% of our students are non-white. Over 50% are first-time college goers, and 40% are free and reduced lunch. So then the question becomes: How do you explain that these kids are making A's, B's, and C's in honors-level courses with master teachers? Some of the academic and vocational goals, um, North Carolina has a future ready core curriculum, so you know, pretty similar state by state. Um, I, I think we will have students at the end of their fifth year who will have accumulated 60 NC State course credits. So that's roughly two years of NC State course credit. Um, students prepared for what's beyond. So whether it's going to work, maybe might have some students that want to go to a community college and obtain some kind of certification so that they can go right into the workforce, go work for a couple of years, go back uh, and finish out their four-year degree. Uh, you want students prepared to function uh, productively and be effective and, and have them ready for work. Some of the 21st learning outcomes, and, and I reference a, a website, I highly recommend that if you haven't already visited this site, um, they do a really good job of laying out uh, really 21st century outcomes. You know, what, what do we want? Uh, you know, anything from, uh, you know, the interdisciplinary core content, I've talked a little bit about that. Um, the learning and innovation skills related to critical thinking and problem solving. When you talk to college professors and you ask them what's missing now from kids that are coming to, to college, one of the first things that they're going to say is this, this idea of critical thinking, problem solving, uh, willing to accept failure, and picking yourself up by the bootstraps and moving on. Um, this mastery of information media technology, which is just exploding. Um, you know, I'm ha I have a hard time keeping up, uh, and our kids are, are, are just doing amazing things with respect to um, this information media. And then the life and career skills, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, we have a dedicated career development coordinator. Uh, it's a 12-month position, and uh, this person, their focus is on bringing the relevance either through the business community or through NC State University in particular, you know, why is it important that you master this math? Why is it important that you understand the economics of building this pipeline? And so <clears throat> through uh, job shadowing, uh, career exploration, all of our students will do an internship. Um, th this is a really important piece to me. 
I like to talk about the school in terms of the three-legged stool, and, and this might be one of the most important slides because this is this is kind of my elevator speech. In terms, talk to me about what what does your school look like? Um, well, I think you start with the curriculum, and you start with the grand challenges. You align the grand challenges that relate very strongly to the science that you teach at a given grade level. So we teach honors earth science with an engineering design class attached to it. Honors Chemistry, Engineering Design 2, Honors Biology, Engineering Design 3. But again, as I mentioned before, it's really about the humanities. It's about economic, ethical, legal, political, social sustainability issues. It's, we always need a better pipe, no question about that. But how do you explain that uh, three-quarters of a billion people in the world do not have access to clean water? It's about money, politics, uh, warlords. Um, it's not necessarily about the STEM. So if we can give the kids an appreciation through the grand challenges of, you know, teach them about the STEM-related focus of a grand challenge, talk to me about the humanities and, and the communication skills that are required and the, the project-based learning. Um, and project-based learning, meaningful use of technology, that's our pedagogy. That's how we teach. Uh, you do not see... 50 minutes of lecture and discussion here. What you see are students, and I call it the buzz, uh, when you walk into a classroom, the kids are engaged. If it's a math class, we call it math talk. And so they're talking about solving problems and different approaches uh, and uh, not listening to a lecture discussion. Not that you don't ever provide information, but um, since we are a one-to-one -one laptop school, the kids will access this information at home, uh, and then they come to class ready to work on projects and activities and um, uh, things that are not uh, what a typical classroom might look like. Uh, and then the whole child development piece, for me, um, that's teaching them how to Socratically seminar. So that, that's getting at the communication skills, the willingness to listen to other opinions, piggybacking on their uh, ideas, uh, this whole notion of college readiness. Uh, academic is important, but you could argue that the non-academic uh, pieces such as self-advocacy, uh, responsibility, time management, again, when you talk to college uh, professors, this is, these are pieces that um, they don't see a lot uh, as much as they have seen in the past. No. And then career exploration, we talked about that. Uh, for the core curriculum, just to give you a sense, um, the grand challenges uh, that we uh, teach in ninth grade are listed there. Um, Honors Earth Science Engineering Design, it's a year-long uh, flex flexible schedule, so you don't teach science on Monday, engineering on Tuesday. Th this is totally up to the needs of the students and the teacher. So they're responsible for covering these two curricula over the year long. Um, we do teach integrated math, um, now called Common Core Math, uh, and our kids take math for at least four straight semesters to get them up to the point where they're ready to uh, take on some of the math that they'll be experiencing in the state. So we kind of fast track the math. Um, but the science, engineering, design, and the humanities, uh, English and social studies, uh, they are also year long and um, they're bringing grand challenges to their classrooms. Uh, some in our course, um, we had two major foci. We, we, in years one and two, we did this year long because we were developing the curriculum and figuring out what does this really look like. Um, in year three this year, we went to uh, just a semester. We feel real comfortable now with what we need to be doing uh, with respect to a seminar course. And uh, in faculty discussions, we have agreed that we can bring the seminar course content into the core courses. This is an example of a project in Honors Earth Science Engineering Design, so it, it's uh, access to clean water. Uh, you can see some of the North Carolina Earth Science Standards and also Engineering Standards. So just to give you a sense of uh, you absolutely can align your instruction to the standards in the state. <clears throat> this is an Honors English One World Geography, uh, and so projects are going to be focusing on components of both. Uh, they're going to bring a grand challenge into it. They're going to talk about 21st century skills. Uh, our humanities teachers use the engineering design process that uh, is adopted by NC State. And an example of a project was a survival guide project using the Lord of the Flies as the text, which is that's a standard ninth grade text, uh, and, and include the access to clean water uh, in your survival guide. Pedagogy, we talked a little about project-based learning. These are some of the key components. Um, there is a site there. Um, one of our partners is the North Carolina New Schools. Um, very important in terms of providing professional development for us. They also do a great job with providing us with uh, coaches as well. Um, but <clears throat> this tenant, every student reads, writes, thinks, and talks in every classroom every day, that's, that's the basis of, of Common Core. 
Um, we want all children, uh, all children want choice, relevance, and discovery. You heard this word relevance several times. Well, that's really important, and that's, I think, the grand challenge is bring that relevance. Um, you have some kind of entry event to hook a student. You talk about this is what I know, this is what I need to know, and then it kind of morphs into where the, where the students need to go to get the project done. You use a lot of rubrics. Um, and so th it's almost like it's directed by the student in terms of their learning. Uh, and then the community involvement would be uh, serving as mentors and authentic audiences to judge projects. Uh, some of the different assessments, and, and this is just a, a typical list that you're going to see, but you can see it's pretty broad-based. So e everything from NC State course assessments and transcripts to project-based learning and portfolios, uh, standardized testing, Socratic seminar. Um, so we have a lot of different formative and summative types of assessments that we perform here. A um, little bit about student achievement. So I, you have to ask the question, well, Rob, is this working? Uh, well, let's remember the demographics. These are honors level classes, master teachers, state final exams uh, last year, 100% proficiency, teacher made final exam, 88% ABC, final course grades, 86% ABC. Uh, we met or exceeded growth in all the North Carolina state exams that we administered, and we had the third highest overall performance composite out of 25 high schools in Wake County. Uh, last fall, I looked at grades, and you see similar types of numbers um, for blocked courses, so that would be computer programming and math, uh, and then the um, semester grades for the year-long classes. Uh, if you look down to the third bullet, um, we have had, 100, we've had 152 course attempts for NC State courses to date, and 95% of the grades are A's, B's, and C's. I will tell you, in full disclosure, that a lot of those course attempts uh, have been orientation types of courses. Um, but I anticipate that um, I, I think we're going to see a very high percentage of A's, B's, and C's for NC State courses based on, on what I've seen. Um, we've got 84% of our kids have a GPA of greater than 2.0 at NC State, and we've got uh, five 11th graders with uh, perfect 4.0 GPAs. External support, of obviously, Wake County Public Schools, uh, North Carolina State University, um, business advisory board. This is this is a piece that we have been developing over the past couple of years. I think it's critical that a, a STEM grand challenge focused school have because this is where you get the relevance with the business community and higher ed. And so our career development coordinator. This is her uh, body that she works through in terms of contacts. And so any, everything from mentoring to uh, sites for job shadowing to uh, you know, you name it, um, they, they are willing to help. Uh, we are going to become an anchor school in the state of North Carolina for the North Carolina new schools. Um, we're part of the energy and sustainability network of schools, and we also uh, are a partner at NC State's uh, Centennial Campus and take advantage of that. Um, future challenges. Um, this school was developed as a model innovative school with the idea that this idea of replication has to be considered and, and worked on because, I mean, it's nice to have this school for these kids and, and our teachers, but what are we doing here that's making a difference in education? And then that's a really important question uh, to, to think about. Um, the selection of grand challenges uh, locally, regionally, state, national, um, identification of college readiness. We, we've worked really hard and I'm very happy. We've got an academic progression committee uh, that uh, creates a trail of academic achievement and also we've developed a rubric um, with 19 non-academic factors that we uh, score the students on and that informs decisions about our, our students ready for NC State coursework, um, developing a mentor-mentee program that will get off the ground next year. Um, NC State research study. Um, we're looking at uh, working with College of Education professors. Um, we want to get at this idea of uh, how interested, what, what are the attitudes and behaviors towards uh, STEM education at a STEM school versus a non-STEM school. And then we also have the uh, College of Engineering outreach uh, to middle and elementary schools that we're real involved with. And then I have a whole host of appendices. Um, here's the Academic Progression Committee that I mentioned. Um, these are design principles that uh, we adopt from the North Carolina New Schools, and this is good teaching. Uh, you want kids ready for college, uh, powerful teaching and learning, and so forth. And you almost could argue this number three here, personalization, is, is to me is probably the key. 
uh, a common instructional framework, so students reading, writing, thinking, talking every day, every classroom, and then collaboration, the focus on writing and literacy, um, this idea of questioning, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, scaffolding work. So you are taking a group of students and you're scaffolding their interpretations. You have a group over here that doesn't need that scaffolding because they're already where you want them to be. And there's a lot of classroom talk. Uh, this is a, a table of the grand challenges by science courses. So you will notice that not all 14 are here. Um, we will look at the ones that are not on this current list and we'll have seniors next year. So through their honors English and civics economics, we'll be uh, tackling uh, one, of, one that I think that we'll probably use um, will be the um, rebuilding our infrastructure. That absolutely is a civics economics uh, related challenge. This is kind of an interesting approach uh, that gets at the interdisciplinary connection. So if you think about what is the influence of an economical issue on science, so it gets the kids thinking about, well, how does money relate to science, research, application, engineering? Um, what's the influence of an ethical issue? Um, so th this, is, this is a template that um, will get the kids to, to critically think. And then I've got some proposed uh, ninth 10th, 11th, 12th, and we call it the super senior year. So these are um, proposed course sequences for, for next year. We have been evolving over the past three years, and so I think we're almost there in terms of we'll have a really tight uh, five-year curriculum. Uh, I talked about project-based learning attributes. These are, these are the key components, in my opinion. Uh, this was developed by our faculty. Um, and we are currently uh, doing walkthroughs looking for these attributes and we've done about 95 walkthroughs since November and collecting the data and seeing what are we doing and not doing with respect to project-based learning attributes. And my contact information and I'll give it back to Jeff. Great. Thanks a lot, Rob. It was okay. a great presentation. It was great to learn a lot about the curriculum and how these grand challenges are being incorporated. So we'll take a second now to uh, answer any questions from those who are listening in. And I did have some questions come in uh, about whether these slides would be available later uh, because Rob moved through the last couple pretty quick. So don't worry, you didn't have to write everything down. We will send out an right. email tomorrow with a link to the right. PDF and all the slides and the links and all these resources you've seen tonight. So those will be available after the presentation also. Okay. Um, so I guess to start things off, Rob, I was wondering if you could talk a little more. Do you invite, I mean, it sounds like you might um, invite professionals in from the community to mentor or provide additional experience or knowledge in the classroom for some of these subjects? That, that's an initiative that we're, we're doing a lot of discussion with that right now and working with our business advisory board. We've had some of that, but I think that that will become very strong next year. Um, we'll be in our fourth year. Um, we just know a lot more of the faculty and, and the faculty is getting to know us. So I think in time that, that is going to really take off. And, and again, that's where the business advisory board comes in, uh, in terms of uh, even to the point of having a professor co-teach a lesson with a teacher. So for the past three summers, um, we uh, have received some race to the top funding for teachers to do everything from writing curriculum to working on NSF grants. And so they're making connections with professors. So we've had some uh, engagement with NC State professors. It's just going to get stronger as, as the years go on, as the kids become a little bit older. Um, so I, I, I see that coming uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Great. We had a question come in from Liz who asks, uh, Rob, what is reverse brain engineering for your 12th graders, which I'm also very interested in. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't really know exactly what the biology teacher has in mind for that. Uh, so basically, I think we're trying to figure out, you know, how does the brain work and then use that information to, you know, combat disease and, uh, you know, to, to figure out how we think and um, that, that kind of thing. So I'm not, I'm not an expert in that field by any stretch at all. So I would have to do some more reading on that one. And I, I've, not, I've not talked with the biology teacher and what he's doing with that. Right, yep. That's it. Yeah, it's something that's above my head. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, was wondering, oh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you know, it seems like with, surrounded by the grand challenges in a bunch of different subjects, do you know um, what percentage of your students continue to pursue a field in uh, a study related to the grand challenges through higher education or beyond? 
Well, we just have juniors right now. So we we really will not know until we go through a complete cohort, till we get a graduating class, and then see what happens after that. Um, but I can tell you that uh, we currently have 51 juniors. I would say a good 60%, 70% of them are doing something related to STEM. And it could be something, it could be a humanities related, but thinking about getting a job in a STEM, working for a STEM company. So working for a drug manufacturer um, and you want to be an MBA. Um, if you have a strong STEM education, you're going to be much more likely to be hired in that position because you've come from a strong STEM education related to the company that's doing the hiring. So I think you, you, you will see that phenomenon as well. Um, and I think it will just get stronger. I, I think uh, typically early colleges start uh, and you have some kids that are coming for however you want to define the wrong reasons. They, they don't understand what the program is about. They don't understand how, how tough it is because it is a rigorous curriculum. I mean, you, you really have to work hard. Um, and so I think as you go through the years and the school the community, the Wake County community, um, you'll have more and a larger percentage of students that are coming here for absolutely the right reasons. Whereas I think in the first year, it's new. We're talking NC State course credit, uh, you know, just w whatever the, the reason was to come here that's not really focused on a STEM, STEM-related education, including the humanities and project-based. I mean, project-based learning by itself, is that that's a difficult concept for students who are used to just sitting there collecting the information and giving it back on a test. This, this is totally different. So that's, I mean, there, I think there are many, many areas where students didn't quite understand what they were getting into. And I think that over time, we're just gonna have a stronger and stronger uh, cohort of kids coming in every year. So I expect it to stabilize, and, but it's gonna take a couple more years, I think. That makes sense. Yeah, sorry for jumping ahead there. Um, well, right. without seeing any more questions come in, uh, I think we'll move on to close out the presentations for tonight, and I'll bring up the contact information at the end. So definitely feel free to email any further questions to uh, either of our presenters tonight after the presentation. So, Rob, I'm going to take control back here in the presentation okay. to close it out. Okay. Okay. And um, I'll go ahead and mute you. And all right. So I want to thank both of our presenters again uh, for the wonderful job and all the information they've shared with us tonight. It's been a lot of really great information uh, that I hope people will be able to use. Um, I want to remind everyone that a video and audio recording of this webinar will be archived on our website at eeweek.org slash webinars, along with a PDF of the slide presentation and any related links and resources. So please check back later tomorrow for that, and feel free to pass the link along to anyone else you think might be interested. Also, we hope you'll join us for a Twitter chat next Wednesday, where we'll continue the conversation on greening STEM education. We also have two Google Plus Hangout sessions coming up as well to connect students directly with engineers at, at NASA and Samsung. Um, if you haven't seen some of the new resources available for EE Week 2014, please visit the website to browse through some of the new material, like our new Environmental Engineering Educator Toolkit, this includes links to activities, lesson plans, and resources focused around the relation of engineering to topics like biomimicry, sustainable energy and design, recycling and reusable materials, and environmental conservation. The toolkit even includes a list of educational apps and resources, or apps and games, sorry, that focus on the same topics and are designed to be used as teaching tools. We will have an interactive version of the Engineering in Our Planet infographic coming soon with more information about the past, present, and future of environmental engineering. A lot of the grand challenges will be tied in there. Also, keep an eye out for new blog posts, resources, E-Week highlights, and more throughout the next week. This coming Monday also marks the start of the E-Week 2014 photo contest entry period. We are looking for photos from your E-Week events that showcase how students are engaging in environmental education, STEM, and nature. Submissions can be entered anytime between Monday and Friday next week. And all it takes to enter is the inclusion of the hashtag EEWeekPhoto when you upload the photo to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Selected winners will receive a Samsung Galaxy Tab, Samsung Digital Camera, or REI gift card. So visit the EEWeek website for more information and make sure to follow EEWeek on whichever platform you post your photo to so that we can contact you when you win. I want to thank everyone again for tuning in to the webinar tonight. And thank you once again to our great presenters. 
My contact information is on the screen, as are the contacts for our presenters if anyone has any follow-up questions. Um, I'd also be happy to answer any questions about EE Week. And also, please visit the websites provided for more information related to these presentations. So thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a great night, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.